And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker and a colleague, uh, Sarsis Colony, uh, is a designer, uh, senior designer at Heffler & Co., uh, though originally a graphic designer in her hometown of Toronto. After 10 years of apparently never being able to find quite the right typeface for the job, she finally decided to just learn how to make them instead. Uh, jumping careers and a notion to study typeface design at the University of Reading, where she earned her MA in the subject in 2003. Since joining h &Co, she has contributed to the design of a wide range of typefaces, including Verlag, Chronicle, Sentinel, Gotham, Tungsten, and Quarto. She's taught typeface design at Yale School of Art, at New York's uh, School of Visual Arts. And with uh, Sumner Stone, she was a founding instructor of the Typeit Cooper Condensed Program. Uh, and she has also taught principles of typeface design here. Please welcome Sarsis Colling. bright light. Man, oh man. Um, okay, can everybody hear me? Awesome. Just let me know if I step too far from the microphone or start mumbling or rambling or anything like that. Oh. <laughs> okay, so Kara's going to keep me posted. Um, so yeah, thanks Cooper for having me back, um, for letting me back on stage after an epic, like, almost two hour long talk I think I gave about three years ago. This one will be shorter, um, even though it's also kind of two talks um, as build. It's just me though, no, no second person will be coming up to do the second talk. Um, so yeah, as Sasha said, I am a senior designer at Heffler and & Company, and uh, incredibly I've been working there for a little over 10 years now. I'm not sure quite how that happened, but uh, uh, along with my colleagues Andy Clymer, who's in the audience, and Romeo Ruse, we all hit the 10-year mark uh, in 2015. Um, and in that time, Jonathan and I have both noticed, especially in the last few years, that we all too frequently find ourselves poring over proofs together and shaking our heads in disbelief, because after all the years that we've both been making type, which is something like 25 for him and maybe 13 for me, um, and the great variety of projects that we've both been involved with, uh, we're constantly amazed at how new and mysterious problems um, that we never would have foreseen never cease to arise with every single new design. Oh, I just realized my marquee is supposed to be flashing. <gasps> Double bill. Um, I couldn't resist, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so given the tiny range of the medium that we work with, um, essentially, you know, we're talking about 26 letters in two cases, though of course we wind up drawing a good deal more than that. Um, and also the type parameters we deal with in making type in terms of what kind of variation is really possible uh, in drawing them in a way that's still not only legible, but pleasurable for the human eye to read. It's kind of extraordinary how fundamentally different the issues that arise in one project can be from the ones that arise in the next. Um, okay. So in the past year, um, we've released two different families that were both long-term projects I've been involved with. Um, and the concerns that govern these two projects, again, beyond the usual formal questions of color, rhythm, pattern, et cetera, um, were utterly different from each other. And together, they provide a little behind the scenes, sorry, behind the scenes glimpse of two of the many kinds of challenges and adventures that type designers face in the daily practice of our often mysterious and obscure craft. Um, so, part one. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been working at Heffler and Company for over 10 years now, and I would estimate that something approaching a full five of those 10 years uh, have been spent at one point or another working on various parts of the typeface Gotham. Um, and that's the first project I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, so the lion's share of those five years were spent working first on um, the expansion of the Gotham family from a single width into a family of four widths, which was released in 2009, and then on its massive language expansion into the Greek and Cyrillic scripts that we released just this past spring. Um, now, when I say massive, I don't mean it in the sense of the scope of its expanded character set, um, as the Greek and Cyrillic scripts are becoming ever more commonly supported by Latin type founders these days, but massive in the sense of the scope of Gotham, uh, the sheer size of this newly extended family, uh, because we decided to create 
Greek and Cyrillic complements uh, for every single one of its 66 styles across its full range of weights and widths. Um, and that's something which is much less commonly done, it turns out. Now we know why. <laughs> um, so at this point, I imagine most of the people in this room are probably familiar with our typeface Gotham. Um, <clears throat> you might also know that over the years, its original 16 styles, which I should make clear that I was not involved in drawing, the predate my tenure at the studio by about five years, uh, and were drawn by Tobias and Jonathan, along with Jesse Reagan, I believe. Um, anyway, over the years, as I mentioned, they've grown to include Gotham Narrow, Gotham Extra Narrow, and Gotham Condensed. And then, most recently, every one of these 66 styles was expanded into a pan-European character set that includes the Greek and the Cyrillic scripts. Um, but some things you might not know about Gotham have to do with how it's made and what goes into making its various constituent parts work together. Uh, so Gotham is generally referred to as a geometric sans serif, uh, one that's built on the elemental shapes of the circle, square, and triangle. But despite being a geometric typeface, uh, geometric typeface, Gotham is deceptively simple looking. Uh, in fact, nothing about the drawing of its shapes or the morphology of the family itself is particularly simple at all. Um, and as any type designer or any designer at all knows, sometimes a lot of complexity goes into making something look effortlessly, effortlessly simple. And that's kind of the theme of this talk. So uh, get ready for some uh, complex micro <laughs> typography. Um, so that hidden complexity is what I'm gonna give you a, a peek under the hood at tonight. Um, geometry obviously has to give way quickly in certain areas of a typeface. Assigning a geometric typeface project to beginning students can be a great exercise because they're forced to grapple with the myriad optical compensations that are required to render letter forms legible <clears throat> and to manage their weight and color. For example, the acute joins of the Latin lowercase. Uh, all the typeface designers in this room know that in order to make a geometric B, D, P, and Q work, a good deal of thinning needs to occur as the bowl approaches the stem or as the ball approaches the stick, which you can see there. Uh, in Futura, uh, in this letter B, um, Futura is often cited as a prime example of these sorts of necessary adjustments in something that otherwise looks completely geometric. Uh, but Gotham takes this a step further. For instance, here's what you get when you draw a purely geometric circle. Uh, and then place a perfectly circular counter shape inside it to create a perfectly geometric O. And here's Gotham Bold's lowercase o. So I'll just flip back and then flip forward. I think we'd all agree that in text, this appears to be pretty much a perfect circle and quite monolinear in weight. But in fact, when you lay our original perfect circle over Gotham's lowercase o, you can see pretty substantial differences. Can everybody see the blue, white, red? Okay, good. Sometimes these don't show up so well. Um, so Gotham's O uh, in red is wider, and it's also thinner in weight at the top and bottom than the geometrically perfect one, which is in blue. And this is to compensate for the optical illusion that, again, all the typeface designers in this room will know causes horizontal strokes to appear heavier than vertical ones. But those aren't the only differences. Something which underpins all the weights of Gotham is a consistent and very subtle stroke modulation uh, or modulation of stroke weight that is pretty much invisible to the naked eye uh, up to fairly large sizes, but it's there. Um, and it's invisible to the naked eye unless you flip any of its shapes horizontally or vertically. So that's the real O, and that's the O flipped horizontally. Um, again, this is an optical correction to accommodate the fact that as readers of the Latin script, our eyes are so deeply accustomed to the influence of the broad edge as the instrument that constructed our printed alphabet that letter shapes will just look a bit wrong a bit off balance without it. Even letter shapes as simple as a geometric O. Uh, this hidden stroke contrast is most pronounced in Gotham's light and bold weights. We were just looking at the bold. And it makes them the most difficult to draw um, as we try to enable the font to reap the benefits of that stroke contrast while keeping it very much below the level of perceptibility. Um, these shapes are meant to look geometric while not actually being geometric. But even in Gotham's thinnest weight, the thin, where on average its basic strokes are something like only 20 units thick, which may not mean anything to anyone who's not a type designer, but for those who are, it's pretty thin. Um, and it appears completely monolinear to look at. Uh, but there's still this tiny little bit of stroke weight modulation. Um, you know, the left stroke is just a t one unit heavier than the right. Um, and again, you can see this when you flip the shape. 
It looks backwards, but you don't notice this when it's the right way around. Um, and of course, again, the intention isn't for you to see any of this. It's just for the shapes to look right. But anyway, to get back to the other ways in which this family is more complicated than it might appear, um, in the beginning, there was Gotham 1, uh, initially drawn for GQ magazine in the year 2000. And it was good. Thus it begat Gotham 2, and designers everywhere saw that it was good. And thus they begat Gotham Condensed, and Jonathan and Tobias saw that it too was good. But then arose the question of what these two might now beget. Why, you ask, shouldn't we be able to just interpolate an intermediate width or widths in between them and call it a day? Does everyone in this room know what interpolation means? I'm going to be talking about it quite a bit. It's basically a mathematical um, calculation that creates intermediate shapes from extreme shapes. Um, <clears throat> well, no, we can't. Um, because, the kind of, because of the kind of dense settings that the condensed width was intended for, the decision was made to give its curved shapes, like the S and the C here um, on the lower line, endings that were completely vertical, instead of those which sheared an angle perpendicular to the direction of the stroke, um, as in the regular width Gothams, uh, which you can see in the top line. So this is the texture that the sheared stroke endings create in the regular widths. And here's how densely changing them permits the condensed widths to set. You can see it's a huge difference in texture. Um, so to answer the question of what might lie between the two extremes of Gotham's regular width on the left and Gotham condensed on the right, we have to look at these two parts of the family close up. Uh, get used to this, we're gonna be looking at a lot of stuff close up. Um, okay, so here's what happens when you create a simple interpolation or a mathematical blend between the two extremes at the width we call the extra narrow. It feels like just that. It's kind of a half measure. It's neither here nor there. Um, and by that I'm talking about the angle of those stroke endings. They're not vertical. They're not really sheared. It's, it's yeah, just kind of a half measure. So what we did was we forced it to pick a side uh, and created new stroke endings to make uh, this new width harmonize more decisively with the regular widths. Uh, again, here's a pure interpolation of the bold uppercase C. So the interpolation is the white C in the middle. Uh, and then again, that's the corrected version. So original corrected. Um, and again, the subtle stress that I mentioned earlier, the stroke modulation that underlies this entire design, um, makes these stroke ending adjustments actually even trickier than they look because there's no cutting and pasting to be done. Every single one really has to do its own thing. Um, they're not mirror images of each other, even though they might look like they are. And you can see, again, I've overlaid a flipped, uh, vertically flipped version of the C, so you can see just how different those stroke endings are from top to bottom in weight and in angle. Um, these changes also create issues with spacing and kerning, as you can see in how the relationship between this interpolated S and T changes when the S's stroke endings change, as well as how the whole width of the S becomes wider. So again, I'll flip back and forward. Um, another area in which the regular width and the condensed Gothams differ is in counter shapes, like those of the six and nine. In the regular width, they're round, as you can see on the left, uh, where in the condensed, on the right, they're sharp. Uh, and this creates, again, a kind of indecisive interpolation, which also has a funny weight jump, because these shapes are fundamentally incompatible. Um, in order to interpolate shapes, they have to have the same basic structure. Um, so the scale of this, this particular glitch is something that probably mostly only type designers would see, but to us it's like, you know, cataclysmic in proportion. Um, so we have to fix it, and we do, uh, to look like that. Again, agreeing more with the regular width style of completely round counters. Um, so we correct those two and some other things, like the Y, which takes a completely different shape in the two width extremes. Um, so here's the raw interp interpolation in all its confused glory. Yeah, it is sad, isn't it? <laughs> and here's our corrected version. Ah. Um, so next, uh, to compensate for the profound change in the proportions of the uppercase between the two width extremes, we also interpolated the upper and lower case at slightly different values. Um, we make the lower case a touch narrower so that the uppercase gets a bit stronger in relation to it. Um, and this is to compensate for the fact that 
widths tend to get a lot more uh, uh, similar to each other and, and uh, yeah, kind of almost like a bit of a monoculture, the, the narrower that a typeface gets. Um, so this is, we felt this width was picking up a bit too much of that from the condensed. Um, so again, here's the raw interpolation. And here's the corrected version with the lowercase adjusted to be slightly narrower. It's pretty subtle. Um, but here they are laid on top of each other. Again, pretty subtle. But then with a slightly narrower lowercase, we also felt it needed a slightly denser fit. So we tighten up the spacing a bit to turn it into this. Now it's sort of like hanging together a lot better. Um, so this is the aggregate change between the original simple interpolation in red and the final form of the extra narrow in this weight in the blue. <clears throat> so far, all of this probably doesn't seem like so much work, but when you multiply it by the number of glyphs uh, implicated in these changes and the eight masters they're executed on, suddenly it starts to look like a bit more of a project. Um, that's kind of the theme here. Um, I'm a little worried we're gonna start looking like gluttons for punishment by the end of this talk, but we do all these things for a reason, because we're crazy. Um, so <laughs> we get the first four Roman weights done, and I'm into the swing of it and thinking, hey, this is getting easier. These italics are gonna be a breeze, I know what I'm doing. Um, so we started to the same process with the italics and realized that, whoops, uh, these different interpolation percentages we cleverly decided on actually create conflicting slope angles both among the different weights and as you see her here, um, between the upper and lower case themselves within one weight. Um, yeah, whoops. So then we had to manually correct all of those, which actually was less horrible than it sounds, but it was a bit of a job. Anyway, in the end, after a lot more work than we bargained for, uh, we got our hard one Gotham extra narrows from which we were then able to create simple unadjusted interpolations for the narrow width. And I can tell you I have never been happier interpolating a new width of a font than I was when I finally saw these. Um, after all that investment in adjusting the extra narrow fonts from which these are made, they just work. And that's incredibly gratifying. So in the end, this is what the full family looks like at this point, 2009. Um, the styles highlighted in red are the ones which are drawn completely from scratch. Um, and the ones in white are the ones that are interpolated. So, that's 16 initial masters, uh, four in each of the two extreme widths for the Romans, four in each width for the italics. Um, many designers might only make two masters for a weight range like this, especially in a sans serif, um, at the thinnest and the heaviest extremes, uh, and interpolate everything in between, but that's just you know not how we roll at Hefler and Company. Um, and it's also just not the always the way to get the best result in the, the middle range of a family, which is often the range that's most used, especially in text. Um, so anyway, in addition to those uh, 16 masters, we of course add the eight heavily edited extra narrow submasters that we just talked about, which are highlighted in blue in the third column. So to get Gotham's total of 66 styles, altogether that's essentially 24 individual masters to be drawn, um, all of which we then decided to expand into the Greek and Cyrillic scripts. Uh, which made this big family a whole lot bigger. Uh, here you see the Latin at the top, then the Greek in the middle, and the Cyrillic at the bottom. And again, if we look at how many different styles we decided to draw these additional alphabets for, it's a lot. Um, it took us, I think it was two and a half years of work all told, something like that. Um, and we also chose to work with an extended Cyrillic character set, which effectively causes it to double in size. Uh, and in difficulty, if you can see some of the shapes in the extended part of the Cyrillic character set at the bottom there, um, yeah, you can see the sort of texture totally changes once you get to the bottom row. Um, and again, not that this is anything compared with many other scripts, of course. This is, you know, downright simple compared to something like Arabic or, uh, you know, uh, Japanese. Um, so because of the scale of this project, it very much required a team effort. Um, the basic masters of the Greek and Cyrillic expansion were drawn and kerned by Malou Verlum, uh, an independent typeface designer in France, who spent about two years working on this project with us as a freelancer. Uh, they were based on an initial template for the shapes of the Greek and Cyrillic characters that was worked out by Tobias Frere Jones, who also oversaw the project. And then I basically did everything in between. I was acting as Malou's direct editor and supervisor, helping out when drawing or kerning got thorny, and then myself making all the extra narrow versions which because of their complexity, and because at a certain point we started worrying that Malou might never speak to us again, we decided to do in-house. Anyway, uh, just to give you a snapshot of what working on a family with this number of drawn masters involves, um, 
I don't know if everybody can read this, but are Greek and extended Cyrillic kerning proofs just by themselves, this is not the Latin, this is just the language expansion, um, took up about 150 tabloid sized pages per pass, like per round of kerning. And for each round of kerning, we would typically uh, print out two sets of prints, uh, one for Malou, who was the designer, one for me, uh, the editor who was reviewing them because we're working transatlantically, um, sending each other PDFs. And then we would typically do at least three rounds of kerning per master, um, sometimes as many as five. So if you do the math, this actually adds up to approximately 44 reams of tabloid paper or a stack over seven feet high, um, which at one point were all piled up on bookshelves right next to my desk. <laughs> I remember Jonathan coming over and taking a picture at one point because these, this was like an Ikea, an old Ikea Billy bookcase or something that was just like bowing under the weight of this ridiculous number of kerning proofs. Um, Anyway, for the older members of the uh, audience, that's about as tall as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> who's seven foot two. Uh, here he is. Uh, that's Kareem on the right. Uh, and just for scale, that's Hillary Clinton on the left. I found a picture of them together. How could I not digitize it, right? Um, and I should point out that Hillary is not a particularly diminutive person. She's five foot seven, which is about two inches taller than me. Um, so anyway, I digress. Um, so with the addition of all these new and complex letter shapes, uh, it turned out that the sleight of hand that's hidden in Gotham's Latin character set was only the beginning. Um, so let's zoom in again for a minute and take a look at some of the kinds of trickery that take place outside the basic alphabetic and numeric characters that we looked at earlier uh, when things get a little more complicated. So when you're dealing with extreme weights or widths, or in this case, both, all kinds of shapes need special attention. Um, take the Latin lowercase o slash, for instance, in Gotham Condensed Ultra. <clears throat> it's just the lowercase o with a slash through it, right? Of course it isn't. Here's the lowercase o. We start by scaling up the counter to create more room inside the shape and to take weight out of it, as well as taking some weight out from the outer top right and bottom left where the slash is gonna go. So I don't know if you can see the little bits of red at the top right and bottom left, as well as in the counter shape. Um, so it looks like this. So again, there's the original one, and there's the new one. Again, there's subtle changes, but now we just add the slash, right? Of course not. Um, because a similar optical effect occurs inside the counter of an O slash to the one that you see in the crossing of the two diagonals of an X, which again, any typeface designers in the audience will be well acquainted with, um, shapes that should appear as continuous diagonals seem to bend as they cross each other. So, especially at smaller sizes, uh, and when there's more weight in play, this becomes an issue. Um, so in the X, we would compensate by pulling the diagonals apart slightly where they meet. Um, and in the case of the O slash, we essentially rotate the center segment of the slash counterclockwise to compensate for the impression of horizontality it, it creates by appearing to bend as it crosses the counter shape. Um, so we wind up with something that in extreme cases looks more like this. Um, and now we're done, for real this time. Uh, here's what it looked like before, and there's the after. Anyway, if you can't see an improvement, I can definitely start working shorter days. So once we get into the much more varied and complex shapes of the Greek and Cyrillic scripts, especially the extended Cyrillic, all kinds of other factors come into play such as the shapes which seem like they could just be repurposed from the Latin, as the Greek kappa is from the Latin K with its ascender simply reduced to the X height. Um, you can see that in the second column to the right of the K. But in making this Cyrillic ka and its related J, and I apologize in advance to any Russian speakers in the audience um, who can hear how much I'm gonna butcher the names of all these Cyrillic glyphs, um, and probably also the Greek ones for any Greek speakers. Um, so in making the Cyrillic ka and its related j, this stacked form of joining that we have in the Latin k like that is not appropriate. So these shapes are made in this case with a horizontal segment connecting the diagonals to the vertical, as you can see in those final two columns. Um, which of course all starts to go to hell as weight creeps in. As you can see in the bold in the third line, that flat segment has already gotten pretty tiny. And then by the time we get to the ultra weight in the last line, it's been completely swallowed up. Otherwise, these characters would just get ridiculously wide. Um, and this is the widest width of Gotham where things are a little easier. Um, I also want to point out how much the X height increases with weight, which you can kind of see if you scan from the top down to the bottom in the K column. Um, 
it's even worse in the condensed ultra where these shapes basically have slits for counters. There's definitely no room for horizontal segment there. Um, but of course, you might recall from earlier that these weights I'm showing you are all masters, which means we have to be able to interpolate between them. Um, so they have to have the same basic drawing structure. Um, so we construct them in a way that looks unnecessarily fussy in the thin weight. You can see all these little overlaps and things. Um, but which enables us to hide a horizontal segment inside the vertical stroke of the ultra of the exact right weight and length so that it interpolates perfectly as it just barely starts to appear in the black, which is the intermediate weight in the middle um, between the ultra and the bold. And mind you, in this way, it's still almost just like an ink trap at this point. Um, but of course, there's not just Russian to think about either. Uh, for some real fun, we get to draw the pre-1991 Azari Ka with vertical stroke, which, like everything, as you can see, gets more and more challenging as the weight increases. Uh, trying to still make the shape look like a Ka and still carry as much weight as it needs to without getting too freakishly wide, um, yet now we really have to get that horizontal segment in there for this shape not to wind up looking just like a spiky blob. Um, that's how we know when we're done, when it doesn't look like a spike, spiky blob anymore. Um, and of course, this only gets more difficult as the width starts to narrow, so by the time you get to the condensed ultra, the ka part of the shape has had to undergo quite a transformation, as you can see. It's not very happy, but it's as happy as it's gonna get. Um, so from our normal <clears throat> condensed ultra ka, its two halves get pulled apart from each other and both lose many units of weight. Um, and then the joining point of the diagonals has to push to the right, making its sideways chevron shape more vertical to make room for all that stuff we have to get into the middle of the shape. We basically make it almost as vertical as we can without it reading as a straight line, basically, to jam everything else into the middle there. Um, and all of this while trying to, still trying to look as much like its Russian counterpart, the Ka, as possible. Um, it's constructed like this, <laughs> so we can control all its parts independently throughout the whole weight and width range. Um, so. Yeah, there's some kind of crazy stuff going on in there. Um, and in this master, the condensed ultra, you might even be able to see that we resorted to slightly pinching in the center of its vertical stroke in the middle there um, to pull even more weight of it out of it wherever we could without it being too obvious. Um, but lest I make you think that the heavy weights and condensed widths are the only ones that require these kinds of adjustments, because we're probably kind of sick about hearing the con about the sick of hearing about the condensed ultra by now. Um, the thinnest and widest variant changes a lot in this form as well. Um, so there's the ka, and there's the ka with vertical stroke. Its weight might not change, but its width and the angles of its diagonal strokes change appreciably in order to provide a more substantial horizontal for the vertical stroke to bisect without creating a conspicuously dark spot in its center and text. Um, so another area where Gotham's one-two punch of low contrast plus heavy weight starts to require some extreme measures is in the upper horizontal strokes of the Cyrillic day, um, the Serbian bay, and the Greek delta. And I just read them out in like, totally not the right order, but uh, anyway. Uh, as they get heavier, these wind up reaching all the way down to the X height, the heavy strokes, if you can see at the bottom there. Um, and uh, they require their bowls to thus shrink considerably below the X height to accommodate this. Um, while still maintaining the correct proportions and appearance of weight, much like the Latin lowercase g does at the baseline, which you can see third from the end. So the, the O and the G are there for reference for where the X height is. Um, and you can see how much the bowls have to kind of compress down to make room for these strokes. Uh, and you can also see on the right, indicated by the dotted yellow lines, um, that the horizontal top stroke of the Greek sigma, which is like the O shape with a horizontal bit protruding out of its right side, that starts to become a much more intrusive feature as the stroke weight increases. Um, you know, in the, in the top row, it's almost just an afterthought to the shape of the O, and in the bottom row, it's like, you know, making a real anatomical um, case for itself. Um, a similar phenomenon takes place in these uppercase extended Cyrillic shapes, where um, the dominant arch and bowl shapes that occupy the bottom half of the Serbian uh, Che and J. And those are the, f okay, so we've got the H, we've got the, these all sound the same, the way I pronounce them. <laughs> the Che, which looks kind of like a curved four, uh, numeral four. Um, the Che and the J are the third and fourth. Uh, there's the pre-1917 Russian yacht, 
move the force from the end. Um, so those all wind up having to shrink way down to make way for those upper horizontal strokes as the weight increases. So you can notice the relationship to the horizontal, the H, um, in the thin versus the ultras. So anyway, for comparison's sake, you can see them in relation to the Cyrillic Che on the left. That's the one after the H. And uh, the hard sign um, and the Russian R, which is, looks like a P, on the right, um, those bowl shapes stay the same height uh, throughout the weights, but the other ones get a lot smaller. Um, so you can, yeah, just see how much those have to change. Uh, another issue that becomes a new challenge in this pan-European character set is spacing. The fit of Gotham changes in pretty extreme ways uh, throughout its range. As you'd expect, lighter weights and wider widths are more loosely spaced in response to their wider counter shapes. And then spacing tightens up considerably to reflect the spaces inside the letters as counter shapes get narrower, both due to weight increasing and width decreasing. But also, Gotham's extreme weights and widths are optimized slightly more for display settings than for text. So spacing and kerning um, and accommodating different kinds of glyph collisions or gaps, um, which are much more prevalent in Cyrillic and Greek settings than in Latin, um, require very different approaches from one part of the family to the other. One of the most challenging groups of shapes in this regard are the Cyrillic and extended Cyrillic descending characters that you see here. Um, in lightweights, you can see these descending terminals that sit on the right side of all the shapes except for the day, which has it on both sides. Um, their descending terminals function almost like an afterthought, but in heavyweights, their whole other story. Again, they become you know, a much more anatomical feature, um, like the upper horizontal stroke of the Greek sigma that we were looking at a few minutes ago. But in this case, um, this is a feature that uh, brings with it serious implications for spacing and kerning because it's like sticking out of the letter shape so much. Um, I'm showing you the lowercase versions here, and as you can imagine, these get even more prominent and disruptive in the uppercase. In fact, because we organize our kerning proofs by shape type, we actually wound up having to create a separate set of proofs that were organized differently just for the ultra weights in this family. And all I can say is thank goodness for kerning, because without it, these strings get pretty unsightly and heavy weights. Um, not that they're much to look at now, but we do the best we can, again, with what we have. And uh, the descending terminals are important distinguishing semantic parts of these characters, so they have to be given enough prominence to function, even if that means they get a little disruptive at times. Uh, so the Greek lowercase poses its own special challenges for spacing um, and evenness of color, especially in the heavier and more condensed weights with their extremely dense fit. You can see that in the lighter weights, the counter shapes of the zeta, the xi, and the final sigma, that's the three shapes separated by ends um, at the beginning of each of these lines, they look nice and similar uh, to the other counter shapes in the lighter weights, but then you get to the condensed ultra. And in order for these open-sided shapes to have kind of room to do their thing, they wind up having much larger counter shapes relative to the tiny little slits inside most of the rest of the letter shapes, especially compared with the Latin, where the lowercase c is the only one that even comes close. So yeah, I hope that's clear that you know, where there's red, you really notice the difference in those first three Greek shapes compared to the rest of the Latin in the bottom line compared with the top two lines. Um, and the way we deal with this is to make those shapes relatively narrower as their weight increases and their width decreases, which you can see here in the relationship between the zeta and the Latin n. In the thin and condensed thin, which are the first two, um, the widths of these two glyphs are nearly identical, but in the ultra-condensed, the zeta has to diverge and become noticeably narrower in order to not poke distractingly cavernous holes in words. Um, Another interesting shape to work with across this kind of range, both for drawing and spacing, is the mu, which uh, I think in Greek is pronounced me, actually, but I can't seem to make myself say it that way. Um, as you can see, uh, in a wide lightweight, has a middle curved segment that's basically identical to the lowercase u. Uh, but by the time we get to the heavyweights, again, all bets are off, and that curved segment just has to do what it must to make room for everything that has to happen along the baseline of this shape. So you can see how <laughs> kind of compromise it starts to get by the right side of this slide. So here's what our thin mu looks like as an outline, which again seems like its construction is unnecessarily complicated. Uh, in fact, you can't even see here all the seemingly superfluous points that make up this outline. 
you just have to take my word for it. But uh, that's because it has to interpolate with shapes that do this. Um, you can see we've had to push the inside edges of both of the verticals at the bottom outward. Uh, they don't anywhere close to line up with the sides of the counter shape. Um, and we've added a big ink trap in order to create room for that curved segment to even be visible. And, uh, and then that curved segment itself has had to shrink way down to a much smaller version of itself to fit in. So, uh, you know, adventures in typeface design. It just, I could go on. I'll only go on a little bit. Lastly, uh, there's this group of mirrored shapes, um, which sort of present their own special form of hell. Um, most of these are Cyrillic, but they, there's the Greek epsilon representing in there too. Um, which theoretically could just flip horizontally to become the Cyrillic Z. Those are the ones that look like little threes. Um, uh, except, of course, that it isn't just a flipped version of the Cyrillic Z. Um, to different degrees, all of these shapes have to be drawn differently to make them look the same. And again, it's Gotham's apparent geometricness that makes this particularly difficult drawing because we have to hide all that difference. Uh, it becomes sleight of hand in a, in a typeface that's more clearly based on the broad edge, for instance, or has more uh, just uh, formal variation, you, these shapes could just be appreciably different. But in Gotham, they need to look much more like mirror images of each other. Um, an example of this particular brand of trickery is the Bulgarian gay, which looks to us like a backwards Latin lowercase s. So here's our Latin lowercase s. This is the thin weight, I believe, of the normal width of Gotham. <clears throat> and here's what it looks like flipped. Uh, not so nice. And as we saw earlier, as soon as you flip any of Gotham's shapes um, over, you can see all the hidden stroke weight modulation and the implied directionality of the strokes that's totally undetectable when you look at them the right way around. Um, so instead, we draw something that looks like this. So again, there's the backwards S. There's the Bulgarian gay, um, which looks like it's much more similar but is actually very different. So here they are laid on top of each other. The, um, the uncorrected backwards S is the blue and the final Bulgarian form of the Bulgarian gay is in the red. Um, and another one that always trips me up is the uppercase R. Um, this shape appears to be so geometric that it almost looks like it could have been drawn with a compass and ruler. Um, but when you flip it horizontally, you can see how backwards it looks. With all the weight in the upper left corner there, uh, and the whole shape of the bowl appearing to point slightly upwards. I don't know if you guys can all see that, but um, again, this is because of the implicit angle of stress that the Latin script has inherited from the presence of broad-edged writing tools in its very DNA. Even shapes that we want to look totally geometric can't actually be drawn geometrically. Um, so for the Cyrillic ya, ja, which looks like a horizontally flipped Latin R, we alter it to look like this. Um, so again, there's the flipped R there's the, uh, I think the, the color change makes it hard to see the changes, but that's what they look like, the, the R and the Yah uh, facing each other. Um, and here they're overlaid. The differences are pretty subtle, but um, they're crucial to making the shape look like it was actually drawn in this direction. So here's what all this work was in service of. This is the final product, the normal width of Gotham Bold, set in Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic. Um, and I find I actually have a pretty hard time immediately distinguishing one script from another when I see it con set continuously like this, which, uh, because these are such related scripts, this is actually what we were trying to achieve. Um, here they are broken apart, so you can see their respective rhythms a little more clearly. So if I go back, there's Latin, and then Cyrillic, and then Latin, and then Greek, and then uh, Cyrillic, Latin, Greek. Um, so they really do have very, whoops, distinctly different rhythms, but it's, yeah, I don't know. Um, so now we can just take a quick zip across the family so you can see how it all worked out um, in a sort of diagonal fashion from its lightest and narrowest member, the uh, condensed thin. We can just keep increasing in weight and width all the way down to the widest and heaviest, the normal width ultra. And then um, here are the italics. I didn't include anything about drawing the italics in this talk because they're so morphologically similar to the Romans in Gotham. Um, don't get me wrong, they're very much not sloped Romans. They took a hell of a lot of work to make and they're a really tricky drawing for many of the reasons I just mentioned and more. But their basic shapes don't deviate from the Roman shapes. Um, 
and this talk already seemed long enough. So uh, anyway, <laughs> we, we'll take a, unless you'd really like me to talk about the italics, in which case I could do that. But uh, anyway, we'll take a look, quick look at them from the lightest and widest corner in the thin italic uh, down to its heaviest and narrowest corner. Um, and that's probably just about everything you ever wanted to know about Gotham, but we're afraid to ask. However, if you have questions, if there's anything I haven't covered, bring it on later. Okay, so um, now for something completely different. Uh, there's no question that as typeface designers, we spend a lot of time grappling with the kinds of formal, visual, linguistic, and technical micro issues um, that we just got a taste of in our look at what lies beneath the deceptive simplicity of Gotham. And there's no question that these issues come into play in every project we work on to a greater or lesser extent. But another thing we often find ourselves doing um, is grappling with the weight of history and its myriad possibilities for interpretation. That set of concerns was at the core of another family that we, re we released in the past year, just over a year ago, uh, in fact, called Quarto. Um, as you've just seen with Gotham Greek and Cyrillic and the various stages of Gotham's development that came before, um, many of our typefaces take years or even decades to come to fruition, and this one's no exception. Um, it's a typeface that Jonathan Heffler and I started designing in 2006 based on a particularly beautiful historical model, uh, a Flemish type from the 16th century. But because it was one which we felt needed an extra dose of interpretation for contemporary use, what might have started out as a simple historical revival turned into something of an exercise in reinvention as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the story starts in 2006 when the magazine publisher Condé Nast approached us about designing a custom typeface for a new and unfortunately short-lived business magazine they were launching called Portfolio. I think it was around for about two years. Uh, they had used Matthew Carter's wonderful typeface, Big Caslon, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, for the nameplate, the magazine's title that you see here. Um, and they wanted something compatible in style for use inside the magazine for feature titles and general display use. I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Um, so in their final design, Portfolio used an unusually large and eclectic mix of serif typefaces, ranging from Dutch taste old style types to fat face modern ones, um, often crashed together in kind of unlikely pairings like the one you see here. Um, one of those Dutch taste old styles was the one we made for them to use in titling sizes, which you can see in this spread where it says what's wrong with this picture at the bottom. And then, as I said, there's like a, a modern face over on the right where it says finance. Um, it's not usually things that you see combined, but it was just a really interesting approach to the typography. Um, uh, and you can also see uh, the early version of Quarto in this spread where it says the sheikh who would be king of horse racing. Um, you can see the italic in a few other places as well. <clears throat> but back to where it came from, um, which as I said, started with a connection to Matthew Carter's Big Caslon. Um, Matthew based Big Caslon on several of the largest serif types from the Caslon foundry in the 18th and 19th centuries. You can see one of each of those here. I believe the upper one is a recut 19th century version of the original 18th century version um, at the bottom. And although we think of Caslon as a quintessentially English style, it's widely recognized as an English interpretation of the Dutch taste style of Roman types. These are characterized by a tall X height, um, a rather compressed and dense proportions, and a verticality of stress that altogether recall the pattern of a texture of black letter, um, which was a style of type and lettering that had remained very dominant in Northern Europe. The Dutch taste is most famously exemplified by the Baroque types of 17th century punch cutters like Johann Michael Fleischmann, such as this example from 1768, by Jacques-Francois Rosard, uh, shown here in an example from the same year, by Miklos Kiesch, who is actually Transylvanian, um, but who worked as a punch cutter in Amsterdam in the 1680s and who we'll be hearing more about later, and by Van Dyck, whose types came to be known as the Elzevirs, um, as well as by Dirk Voskins. Whoops. Um, sorry, my computer's running really slowly. There we go. Whose types are thought to be the touchstone for Caslon's designs. But that's a whole other story that I won't go into. Um, so we decided to come back full circle and work with one of the earliest examples of these Dutch old style forms, a display type by the 16th century Flemish punch cutter Hendrik Vandenkeer. 
So thinking about dates for a minute, um, it was only in the preceding decades, from about 1530 to 1561, that the old style types of garamond were created. Um, the Romans, which began to be cut by the Dutch and Flemish punch cutters in this later part of the 16th century, were the first Romans in this part of Europe to express a regional approach to the old style, as it had now been defined by Garamond. Um, so this type by Vandenkeer, which I believe was the first full upper and lower case Roman type he actually cut, um, was among the earliest Roman types to exemplify the Dutch taste in typography, the Dutch old style. In fact, it's regarded as one of the precursors of that style coming nearly 100 years before most of the other models we were just looking at. Um, Hendrik van den Keer was born in Ghent in approximately 1540, and he cut some 25 series of types for the plant and printing house in an 11-year period, which I just can't even believe, <laughs> from 1569 to 1580, uh, before his death in 1581. So what you see here, uh, and in the previous slide in paragraph form, jump back, that's the paragraph form, um, is his two-line double pica Roman of 1570 to 73, which would measure as approximately 40 or 48 points today. Um, so in addition to being one of the earliest Dutch old styles, um, even though he lived and worked in Flanders, not Holland uh, or the Netherlands, we use the umbrella term Dutch. Um, and this is also one of the earliest typefaces to be cut at a size this large, as I mentioned, the equivalent of somewhere between 40 and 48 points. Um, up to this point, type had mostly been made at smaller text sizes, uh, lead type. Um, a typeface this size would likely have been intended for use in large liturgical books or choir books. Now, as refined and elegant as Van den Keer's two-line double pica is, I think it's just beautiful. Um, and although many of its qualities were exactly what we were looking for, there were a few things that we knew right away we'd want to alter in our interpretation of it. As I mentioned earlier, this was one of the first Roman types he ever cut. He had primarily made black letter types up to this point, so a few eccentricities appear in this cut, which he resolved a bit better in some of his later Romans. For instance, um, these oddly bold horizontal strokes on the uppercase A, E, and F that you see in the top line, and this rather awkward looking lowercase K, which looks pretty strange to contemporary eyes, might have looked strange to the eyes of the time as well, don't know. Um, don't think Garamond had any had a K like that. Uh, there were also subtler details that we decided to treat differently, um, such as taking the spurs that rise above the top of the uppercase T and adding them to letters like the C, G, and Z as well. And finally, we decided to try to find an alternate approach uh, to Van den Geer's somewhat uncertain treatment of the lowercase terminal shapes on letters like the lowercase C, F, G, and R, which we came to affectionately call the blobs. Um, we wanted to find a way to tighten up and unify them a bit more, uh, make them feel crisper, more decisive, and perhaps more contemporary. Um, but this turned into a bit of an epic battle, the extent of which we had not anticipated. Um, so in Jonathan's initial digitization of Van den Keer's forms, when he was first proposing this model to portfolio, uh, the blobs had been changed slightly to look like this. Um, and so obviously the scan, these are scans of Van den Keer in the top row and then digital renditions of them in red on the bottom row. Um, and then he handed it over to me uh, once portfolio had approved the idea and my first crack at them looked like this. Um, at this point, we were pretty happy, actually, with the G and the R. They didn't really change that much from this point. Um, so then we just had to focus on the C and the F, so that should have been easy, right? Well, we tried version after version after version after version after version after version, and then eventually, uh, we realized maybe we would help ourselves by bringing the J into the mix as well because we realized we wanted to add a terminal to the bottom of the stroke where the source didn't have one, as you can see in the scan at the top. Uh, so then we did a few more versions, back and forth, until finally we arrived at a solution we were happy with. Um, there's still an eclectic range of shapes here, but we hope they feel crisper and more of a piece with each other, um, as well as consist consistent with our version of the A, for which Jonathan had created this um, lovely parabolic terminal shape um, in place of the smaller vertical tick of Van den Keer's original. I think of it as kind of a shower head. 
um, to give it more weight and impact, um, and which became one of the signature moments in the typeface. So in the end, here's Vanden Keer's original um, set in paragraph form as we saw earlier. And here's our final version of it, um, with the spacing all mixed up to set right on top of it. Um, so there's the, sorry, my computer's suddenly behaving really slowly and I don't know why. There we go, so there's the original and there's our version. Um, what we were really trying to do here was hone in on specific characteristics of Van Den Kier's typeface. It's crispness, it's drama, it's austere proportions, and it's almost severe elegance, um, and to refine them down to their essence. We wanted to create something that was as true as possible to the spirit of the source, while also more clearly defining that spirit, uh, whittling out moments that we felt undermined or contradicted the essence of what we saw in it, um, and playing up those that exemplified it. Um, to not merely refine some of the definitive idiosyncrasies of the source, but to interpret them differently in order to give the design a more clear and consistent voice. Um, but of course, that's only part one of this story. Now part two. Um, although we found ourselves reinventing some of Van Den Kier's forms to turn his Roman into a typeface for contemporary use, that battle with the blobs was nothing compared with the challenge of coming up with a companion italic for a typeface that had never had one in the first place. Um, in his entire career, Van Den Kier never cut an italic. So inconsiderate, he didn't realize we were gonna really need this later. Um, this was not unusual in this relatively early stage of Roman typography, to be fair to him. Um, in fact, the very first italic type was cut just 70 years earlier uh, in about 1500 by Francesco Grifo for Aldus Manutius. Um, and that was cut as a standalone style as italics only began to be used for emphasis within Roman text later on. So we set about trying to find a compatible model and asking ourselves the question, what might a Van den Kier two-line double pica italic have looked like? So we began looking for a model that felt like the right starting point and that led us to two slightly later but still compatible examples. Because Van den Kier's design had become at the beginning of a long period of this Dutch taste style, as we looked at earlier, we were able to consider models from as much as 100 to 200 years later, when the idea of a companion italic for this style of a Roman had become a lot more developed. Um, we decided to start from the basic structure of the beautiful italics by the later Transylvanian punch cutter Miklos Kish, who I mentioned before as they appear in this 20th century rendition from the Stempel Foundry for their speed and their discipline. Um, and I've always loved these italics, so for me it was an opportunity to make a kind of tribute to them. <clears throat> and we decided to combine the influence of those shapes uh, with the angularity and vigor of this example um, of a 1742 italic from the French punch cutter Claude Lamel. Um, basically, we decided to create a brand new italic that was based on an imagined hybrid of these two models. So compared with the stempel Kige italics of the first example, you can see how the influence of the second model affected shapes like the M, which gets more extreme in its stroke contrast, um, thicks and thins kind of amplified, uh, and more squarish in its counter shapes. Um, this adds a certain kind of intensity and drama to the shapes, but it also tempers it by slowing the strokes down each time they change direction. So where the Stempel, uh, the Jansen italics kind of, you know, are almost like a zigzag. They're very quick. Uh, ours kind of come up and then over and then down and then up and then over and down and up and over and down. Um, but the, uh, the sort of extremity of the contrast makes them feel faster. So there's kind of a tension in there. You can see similar forces at work in the H, um, as well as the ascender getting much shorter to match the proportions of Van den Kier's Roman, um, as well as in the V, which also gets a terminal shape that better matches our revised blobs in the Roman. Uh, luckily, we had a little less of a battle on our hands with the italics, although they were still tough. <laughs> the blobs were a challenge to the very end. Um, uh, so does the R. Again, you can see that the, the uh, terminal shape is completely different. Um, and that instroke, again, is this much more angular, uh, interrupted style of stroke. Um, and then, of course, the G just kind of has to do its own thing. This is one of my favorite shapes to draw. Again, you can see here how much shorter the descenders have become from the Stempel example that we used as a starting point, um, which really forces the whole shape to change. 
so in the end, here it is uh, compared to Stempel's version of the quiche italics. So that's the Stempel, and that is Quarto's italic. Uh, when you look at it all set together, you can really see how the extenders got shorter, uh, the weight and contrast both increased, and it got a bit more angular and squarish overall. So jumping back and forward. Um, and then here it is compared with the lamell italics, um, where you can see that it's become narrower and more upright with a more consistent slope angle, uh, narrower capitals, and less varied letter widths. Um, by the way, I've awkwardly distorted the line and word spacing here to, again, to match the lamell specimen. This is not how Quarto's italic sets. So, again, there's the lamell, and there's Quarto. Um, so, now here are the final Roman and italic together. Um, but of course, that's still not the whole story. Part three, which happened after Portfolio's demise in 2009, was the project of extending the family into a broader weight range than would ever have been made in Van Den Kier's day. Um, so this was the initial weight that we made, the medium and medium italic that we drew for Portfolio. Um, next, we decided to create this more delicate lightweight of the Roman and italic. The challenge here was to see how much weight we could take out of it while still having it feel like quarto, uh, because the pattern of dense vertical strokes in the medium weight is such a defining feature of this family. Uh, again, you know, hearkening all the way back to the gothicness of the sort of gothic influence of the Dutch old style, um, we knew the light couldn't lose too much of that weight and contrast without also losing its identity. Um, and then at the much heavier extreme, we created this very dense and bold black weight. Um, which was a lot more challenging than the lightweight because this kind of extreme weight and extreme contrast between thick and thin only started appearing in type in the 19th century, um, much later than any of the models we've been working for, for uh, working with for this design um, and working for at times. Um, anyone who has designed a contemporary old style typeface will tell you that it takes some doing uh, to prevent it from turning into a bit more of a modern face in its bolder weights, um, as when you're making a bold, you generally predominantly add weight along the vertical axis or the letter shapes start to kind of fill in. Um, and of course this was especially challenging in quarto because of the strong verticality uh, of even the medium weight. The old style bold is a tricky anachronism at the best of times and that made it even trickier. So making quarto's black roman and black italic look like they were a logical extension of the more typical weights of a 16th century typeface was no easy feat. Uh, we see them as a kind of old-style fat face. Um, they have the weight and contrast of a modern fat face while maintaining, to the best extent we could, the oblique angle of stress of an old-style. Um, but it was also really fun. The black and black italic were a total kick to draw. Um, in the heavier weights, we wanted to play up the snarl and snap that the lighter weights were already starting to hint at, um, but to let the addition of weight really kind of crank them up to 11. Uh, the tricky thing here was to throw as much weight as we wanted to into the black while still maintaining all the crispness of form, um, such as in the shapes of the stroke endings, in the beak serifs, et cetera, that gives quarto its kind of fiery temperament. Um, we found that if we added too much weight, it started looking like a caricature of itself, losing the tension between a kind of ferocity and elegance that we felt was one of its defining features. Um, there was a similar challenge in the italics as well because their rhythm really comes from an emphasis on the persistent repetition of their vertical strokes, well, their sloped vertical strokes. Um, putting too much weight anywhere else seemed to slow the shapes down in a way that undermined the vigor and intensity that we were aiming for. But we got there eventually, um, and interestingly, these heavy weights are the ones I've been seeing used most out in the wild so far. Um, so in the end, here's the entire uh, final family we created. Um, I thought I would set it in some Dutch New York place names since we have so many of them. Um, uh, including ones that nobody seems to be able to agree how to pronounce. Skirmerhorn, Schirmerhorn, Skirmerhorn, Skirmerhorn, Schirmerhorn, anyone? <laughs> Schirmerhorn, Sch. Um, I'll try and get that in for next time. Uh, and also because this typeface essentially became a kind of mashup of 16th century Flanders and 21st century New York. Uh, in a great little article that Paul Shaw wrote about Quarto for Print Magazine this summer, I don't know if Paul's in the audience. Paul? No? Um, he referred to it as 1570s Ghent, or I know it's Ghent, <laughs> um, meets 1970s New York, and I can't think of a description that I could have liked better. Anyway, here's the light, the light italic, the medium, 
the medium italic, the semi-bold, semi-bold italic, and as you've all learned from Gotham, some of the, just a few of these weights are interpolations of the original masters. Um, bold, bold italic, the black, and the black italic. And that's the whole family. Um, as a kind of epilogue, in a bit of poetic justice for its origins as a display face for a portfolio, uh, we were recently delighted to discover that Quarto has been selected as the new display typeface of the Atlantic. Um, you can see it in, on the cover just in the upper right there. Um, it's used a lot more extensively inside the magazine. Um, so in its expanded form, it's fulfilling its original mission again on the glossy pages of this wonderful magazine. Um, I especially like seeing it in their pithy pull quotes. I don't know if you guys can read it. I put this in here for Nick Sherman, who I don't think is here, but um, the, oh God, I can't even read it. The bloody minded death demolishing longevity of ACDC and Motorhead cannot be counterfeited or repeated. I think we can all agree with that. Uh, but then it was also recently used by Jägermeister in a campaign about the 56 ingredients they used to get you really drunk. So um, we hope this means that Cordo will have a future as long and as varied as its history, and that all you typographers out there will enjoy using it, especially now that you know a little bit more about its many and various ingredients and how it was made. Thanks. <laughs>